Welcome to Casual Friday. So today I am going to announce how the August sock knit along is going to work. I'm going to answer a question that came up in one of my videos this past week and then I'm going to share with you my finished serviceable sweater. If you want to jump from spot to spot in the video there's always direct links down in the description. Late in December I got really interested in vintage knitting patterns. Vintage knitting patterns and antique patterns. So vintage would be anything up to 100 years old and antique would be anything older than that. And so two of the things that I, types of projects that I really like knitting are sweaters and socks. Now when I was diving into this I really wasn't all that interested in vintage sock patterns because I figured that the way we knit socks today is how it's been knit, how it's been done for hundreds of years is one of the first things that that people did when they learned how to knit was to start knitting stockings. So I really didn't think there would be any new thing new to discover. I knew that stockings were quite different than socks because of the length and and the materials and the gauges at which they were knit. But otherwise I thought the techniques were probably essentially the same. Well when I started researching patterns in order to find a World War I era sweater pattern to knit. I was, it was taking me a while to find anything I liked and I started coming across sock patterns and I decided I wanted to do some research on the Kitchener stitch because Lord Kitchener was commander of the British forces during World War I is often credited with either inventing grafting inventing the grafted sock toe or asking that a grafted sock toe be invented and or um, for having a pattern that he then uh, provided to say the Red Cross and said these are the socks that I want my soldiers to have. So as I was doing my research it became really apparent that Kitchener had had no involvement in this whatsoever. He had asked Queen Mary to to organize 300,000 pairs of socks to be knitted for the soldiers in a two month time period. But he, there was no, nothing in the newspapers or any of the other contemporary materials that suggested that he directed what sort of sock to knit. And if he had directed what sort of sock to knit, that wasn't what <laughs> knitters around the world were doing, at least not at the beginning of the war. By the end of the war, four years later, so many people had learned to knit socks and so many patterns were shared and so many discussions about what would be the most comfortable sock to wear. That discussion had happened thousands and thousands of times to the point where gradually a specific type of sock was the one that was deemed best, most comfortable for soldiers. And that sock included a grafted sock toe. So I was really interested to know when were sock toes grafted prior to that because it was clear that there were a variety of ways of finishing sock toes and so I started doing research and pretty soon I came across a book published in 1852 that did not suggest grafting a sock toe but it did include a method for grafting that was quite different than anything I'd seen before and I haven't been able to find the same method in any other book since then and I really looked. That book was called The Finchley Manuals of Industry Volume 4 and I did talk about this in a previous video which I'll link to up there. Um, and what came out of that also was a technique video for what I called the Finchley Graft which was named after the Finchley Manual where I found the graft. I began getting a lot of comments about that video from people who said, oh maybe now I'm going to knit a cuff down sock oh I've always been afraid of the, the Kitchener stitch but this looks so easy or I've always hated the Kitchener stitch but I really like this approach. So I kept getting comments like that and I began to wonder if this could be a turning point for sock knitters who have previously shunned the top the cuff down sock because they didn't want to have to do any and they wouldn't want anything to do with grafting. Maybe this was a turning point for them. Maybe then they would embrace the cuff down sock rather than thinking that toe up was the only way to go. So I kind of wondered aloud in a casual Friday a few weeks ago if there would be any interest in a August sock knit along. 
and it wouldn't be where I would provide a very specific pattern that everybody would follow, but instead it would be a knit along where people learn how to knit a custom fit sock for their foot and leg situation. Socks are designed by formula, and if you understand how, what the formula is, and you know what the formula expects of the person's foot to be who would be wearing the sock, then you can understand how you can make modifications at those tricky places, particularly at the heel where fit seems to be a cause the most issues with fit. They certainly do for me. So the idea for this knit along would be not that there would be a pattern, but that would, you would learn the process of construction. You would learn to, what to measure. You would learn to, to see where your fit issues were likely to be. You would learn what the formula is and so that you would know how to adapt that formula. This would then allow you to use other knitting patterns and adapt those um, so that you can create socks that fit you but you would also be free to knit socks on your own without a pattern. So I did get some response that yes, people were interested in this. So I started really thinking the past few weeks, how would this look? How would I, how would I operate this? What, what would it encompass? What would the limits be? Who would be the sort of knitter that would be, want to take part in this or who I would welcome to take part of this? So I really want to include as many knitters as I can who would like to be involved in this. So if you're a novice sock knitter, you are welcome to join the knit along. If you're an experienced sock knitter, I think you'll probably learn some new tricks and tips that you hadn't known about before. So really anybody is welcome. Now, if you're a little bit of a nervous novice and you maybe get are overwhelmed by the choices that, that are available to you, you can take a very directed path. Um, it will still be based on your measurements, but you won't have to make as many decisions about how to proceed as you would if you were left with all of the choices that are going to be available to you. So the things that we're going to be doing in this knit along is discussing how to, how to deal with leg shaping. If you have a leg that needs that and cannot um, be encompassed by a straight tube, a straight cylinder of knitting. We're going to talk about discrepancy between ankle measurement and ball of foot measurement and how to ac accommodate that difference when you turn the heel. We're specifically going to focus on the heel. You're going to have options for the type of heel that you work. You're going to be given instructions for how this heel works, what the formula is, and how you can address the fit knowing and understanding that formula and then knowing and understanding what your actual measurements are, how you can make that happen. So you'll have choices um, between heel flap, uh, short row heel or peasant heel. And with the heel flap, you'll have a choice of stitch pattern that you can use and also a choice of, of heel turn that you could use. If you don't understand sock anatomy yet, we'll be covering that prior to the start of the knit along. We'll also be talking about sock toes and how to adapt them in order to fit your toes because toes vary in length and shape and therefore the toes often benefit from being adjusted. So the way that this knit along is going to work, I'm going to create a pattern on Ravelry that will really be in the form of a tutorial in multiple parts. The first part will be uploaded this weekend. It's not available as I speak, but it will be available this weekend. And that will cover all of the things that you need to do prior to casting on for your sock, things like a what kind of um, tools and materials you're going to use, doing gauge swatching, taking your measurements, that sort of thing. All the things that you need to prepare for prior to casting on. This, the knit along starts on August 1st, but these written reference materials are going to start this weekend and just about every week I'll be uploading a new chapter in the reference materials um, that will help you make decisions and understand how sock construction works and also allow you to choose um, the different components of the sock. You don't have to make all of those decisions prior to casting on. You still have time after you cast on while you're knitting the leg of your sock, but it will give you things to think about and learn about and, and um, before, before the actual cast on begins. I have a number of sock related technique videos on my YouTube channel already, but I will be creating additional sock related technique videos for my 
my Technique Tuesdays between now and the end of August. And on Casual Fridays, I will include a section on the sock knit along every week until the end of August as well. I'll be covering various topics about sock knitting in that section. Some of it will be directly rated, related to the knit along and some of it will just be history of sock and stocking knitting that I think you might find interesting. I've mentioned before that I am not a yarn stasher but I do make an exception for sock yarn. So I do have quite a lot of sock yarn and so my plan is that uh, on September 15th, anyone who has completed their pair of socks by that point will be eligible for a drawing in which I will select some very nice sock yarn from my stash that I will send out to a few lucky winners. The cost of the knit along if you want the written reference materials will be $10 and I will announce on social media and in my Ravelry group um, as well as put a link, I will put a direct link down in the video description here as soon as that is available for purchase on Ravelry. It should be this weekend. So I had one question come up in my video comments this past week. It was a comment on an older video, but it really pertains to any of my videos or actually any YouTube video for that matter. The comment was that I was talking too fast on one of my videos, that she was just starting to absorb one of the things I said, and then I was on to the next thing. So I do know that some of my videos really do clip along, and that's part of that is, is how I edit them in order to really compress the information into um, as short amount of time as you can. That's also why I put timestamps to each section of my video down in the description so that if you need to review a particular part again, you can get right to that point. But there are some keyboard shortcuts that can be really useful when you're watching YouTube videos. One of them, now they're gonna be a little different for mobile devices. I don't know all the commands for mo mobile devices. I do know a couple of them. Once you know that these things exist, you can look them up. But if you're using a desktop computer, you can hit the space bar to pause the video. It will just stop right there. You can hit the arrow keys, the left and right arrow keys, and that will jump you back either five seconds or 10 seconds. So the left arrow key will jump you back five seconds and the right arrow key will jump you forward five seconds. So that's helpful if you, if you were trying to knit along and you're like, you were concentrating, you're like, wait a second, you can just go tap, tap, tap a few times and you can jump back. If you're on a mobile device, like an iPhone or an iPad, I don't know about and how this works with Androids, but with an iPhone or an iPad, when you're looking at the video playback screen, you can tap on the right side of the screen or the left side of the screen, double tap, and that will jump you back as well. Then one more thing that can really help if you feel like the entire pace is just a little bit too fast for you, um, you just wanna slow the whole thing down a little bit so you have time to process. Another thing that you can do is at the bottom of the YouTube playback screen, uh, there's a little gear. If you click on that gear, that allows you to control how fast the playback speed is. So you can have it, uh, go one or two times faster, one and a half times faster than normal, or you can slow it down a little bit. So that might help. It does distort the speech a little bit, but it's not, it's not really awful. So that is another solution, whether it's my video or somebody else's. So this is weighted down a little bit because I've got um, my microphone in here and I don't have pants on. <laughs> to hang it off of so it's going to droop down a little bit um, but this is my serviceable sweater my world war one sweater that i've been knitting for the past oh month or so started it at the end of may i did add a few repeats at the bottom hem and then decreased them out as i went up to allow a little more room for um, my hips so that it wouldn't stretch at all and I have uh, vintage buttons here um, as well, which I really like. So uh, let me show you how I did the button bands because this was something I had never done before exactly like this. So I wanted to show you what I did with these button bands. It was something where I'd done uh, two, two aspects of this technique before but never combined. So let me show you. So what I did was I lined the button bands, I faced the button bands with 
grow grain ribbon and I sewed the buttons on to that. So this gives the button band some stability. It keeps it from stretching sideways when the, when the uh, button bands are buttoned. And if you sit down and you move around and they start pulling apart pretty soon, you end up with these scalloped edges. No matter how perfectly you sewed everything on to begin with, things get stretched out. So this prevents this really from stretching sideways because it's stabilized by this woven button. Now I did the same thing on the back side, but in this case I had to also put buttonholes in. So I used my sewing machine to create these buttonholes and then I lined everything up with the knitted buttonholes and then I sewed that band down. These buttons are an inch and an eighth across and I made the buttonholes an inch and a quarter across for the woven part. Now this took me three, three times before I realized that I'd been doing things incorrectly. Um, because on the knitted side, with knitted buttonholes, you always knit them smaller than the buttons because they will stretch to fit. So I started out knitting a buttonhole that was much too small. Then I realized oh, I need to knit them bigger. And in some, for some reason, I didn't think to look it up and I just remembered incorrectly that it should be an, in, an eighth of an inch smaller than the button and that somehow this is gonna magically stretch. And that is not the case. What you have to do is knit the buttonhole an eighth of an inch or you have to sew the buttonhole an eighth of an inch larger than the button. So on my third try, I finally got it right. So I looked online about whether I should sew the ribbon buttonhole to the knitted buttonhole. What I was worried about was that because the knitted hole was smaller, I would either have to stretch it out in order to sew it on or that just that it wouldn't be compatible. So I decided to just kind of sew down in the middle and so that the, the woven part wouldn't gap open uh, too much and it looks like from things I've read that if they're pretty small buttonholes you don't even have to do that these are just pretty large and so I, th I felt that that it would be a good idea to do that um, so both of these have been um, sewn down by hand all the way uh, up to the po point where the collar meets and now I don't tend to unbutton my cardigans I I just pull them on over my, my head and I basically wear them as a pullover. I just prefer the look of the cardigan fronts. And I just, so I just pull this over on the top of my head, but this I could button and unbutton if I wanted to. So in the past, I have used that trick of sewing grow grain button on the backs of the button bands twice. The first time and the only, well, the first time I did that was I have a gray, sweater that's two-tone gray with uh, cables coming down the front and there's a magnet closure it doesn't have button or buttonholes just a magnet closure and for that sweater i stabilized the backs of the bands with ribbon and i really really liked the way it holds its shape and even when it's not uh, connected with the magnet it hangs nicely i really really like that look for my first vintage sweater the edwardian sweater that i knit earlier this year that was also a button closure in the front and the whole reason I knit that sweater was to try to understand how to make the front closure work because the fabric was very unusual and there wasn't a good uh, photograph that showed what was going on and there was a very vague explanation about what to do. And what I ended up doing with that one was again facing the backs of the button bands with ribbon and I did put buttonholes in the buttonhole band but there were not buttonholes in the actual knitted part. In that case the ribbon was here and the fabric was here and the buttons came through the buttonhole fabric and were just lying parallel with the two pieces of fabric in between on those two pieces. That was the only way that I could make that combination of fabric and button band work. So this was going to be the first time that I was going to use ribbon, a grow grain ribbon facing a button band, have buttonholes in both the, the knitted fabric and the ribbon and then sew buttons on. So I, I was uh, looking forward to that. Now, one of the reasons I really thought this was gonna be important was because this sweater was a, is a little bit longer than I normally wear. It's, it's not as long as I was imagining it was going to be, but I do have another cardigan that's quite a bit longer. 
and it comes down over my hips so when I sit down the button band pulls and even though I sewed the buttons on perfectly and everything was um, perfectly lined up when I first finished the sweater over time as I've sat in it and it's pulled the button band has kind of gotten scalloped so by putting the, the button band a ribbon, putting the, the ribbon on the backs of the buttonholes, that stabilizes that and prevents um, the fabric from pulling up, apart like that. So one of the problems I had <laughs> was that uh, I, it took me three tries to get the buttonholes correct in the button band. Now I, I had just done buttonholes in those ribbons in my Edwardian sweater a couple of months ago and so I'd read all about how to do that and I, I practiced and I knew that it was going to take me one more ribbon than I really needed just so I could practice and get, get everything right. So when I bought the ribbon for this, my serviceable sweater, I asked for twice as much ribbon as I needed. I told her I wanted extra and so she was just going to give me a little bit extra to practice on. I said, no, no, give me twice as much. And she's like, oh, okay. I just know that something like this, where once you make the buttonhole and you cut it, that's it. You can't undo that. And I knew I would make mistakes and I and allow allow for that. So the problem was I didn't really think things I think think things through in terms of how I should practice. So what I did was I re, I measured, made sure I put the sweater on my dress form and made sure that it was hanging to the length it was supposed to be and nothing was pulling up because when the sweater just lays on a table, it wants to draw up a little bit and especially the garter stitch button band wants to pull more than the other fabric. So I didn't want to sew a, a ribbon on that was shorter than what I really needed because then once it was sewn on, it would, it would forever lock that button band into that length. So I hung the sweater on my dress form, measured it, made sure everything was lined up correctly, the two bands with each other. I measured the length, make sure it was what it was supposed to be. And then I measured off the, the ribbon and cut two pieces of ribbon to match. And, for, and then I also marked where the buttonholes were supposed to go. The problem was that I didn't think correctly about how big those buttonholes should be. When you make a knitted buttonhole, the buttonholes are always smaller than the buttons because the knitting is going to stretch. So I thought, oh, the knitted buttonholes are, are this big. That's how big I'll make the sewn buttonholes. But those don't stretch. And I didn't practice on just one buttonhole and make sure that it fit. No, I did the entire button band of all five buttons, did all of them and then realized that the button was way too big to go through there. And then I remembered, oh yeah, there's supposed to be an eighth of an inch difference between the buttonhole and the button. But I should have looked it up, I didn't. And I made the buttonhole an eighth of an inch smaller than the button. And again, I did it for the entire button band. So then once the second, once I had done it completely wrong for the whole button band the second time, I, I went and looked online to see what it was supposed to be and I saw, oh, it's supposed to be an eighth of an inch bigger. And I just did one more buttonhole in one of all the already ruined buttonhole bands and tried it out, made sure the button would fit through it. It did. And then I did the final buttonhole band the next morning because I was fed up with myself uh, by that time. And then it all worked out and I sewed everything in and and lined everything up and it worked out really well and I'm, I'm really happy with it. Now I still haven't washed or blocked my sweater. One of the things I've been doing this week is washing some of my raw fleece and I ha I dry it on a, a mesh sweater rack and um, so that has been taken up with, uh, with raw fleece being washed and I have time before it uh, gets cold again. And so I'll wait until the fall probably or later this summer to wash the sweater and get it blocked um, perfectly. Um, but I'm pretty happy otherwise with how it is. Well, that's it for this week's Casual Friday. I really hope you join me in the August sock knit along. If you have any comments or questions about today's video or suggestions for videos you'd like to see in the future, you can leave those down in the comments below or join the discussion in my Ravelry group rocks rocks. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next week.